What's up, guys? So, firstly, I want to talk about why I've been gone um, for about three weeks to a month now. I haven't recorded or posted a video. Um, main reason, it's, it's pretty simple. The Log4j attack um, came out, and we have thousands and thousands of servers at work, so I've been nonstop busy ensuring that we're, we maintain a security posture that is appropriate. So, simple as that. I've been super busy, and that's why. Um, I am going to do a Log4j video, um, but I want to give it a little bit of time, probably this weekend, maybe the next week, um, mainly because it's still a running attack. I don't want to add to people doing the attack, and I know a lot of people always give me shit on that. They say, oh, well, someone's already posted a proof of concept. Why don't you do it? Um, it's not about the fact that someone looking for it can't find it, because that can happen all the time. It's that someone that isn't looking for it, stumbles upon my video and says, oh, this is super easy. Let's do it. So I'm not going to dive too far into the log4j on this video, but I just am letting you guys know where I'm at and why I haven't posted for one and for two, why I'm not going to post a log4j video right now or the log4 shell, whatever you want to call it, attack. Okay. So this is another um, act. This is the active reconnaissance room. This is continuing our pen testing, junior pen testing path, and we're going to just jump right into it. So the first one we did, the passive reconnaissance, that was the last video we did. That was super um, easy. It was just stuff that you can do basically using um, oper or OSINT information and things like that. It's just a way to get information about a company, organization, person, whatever you're trying to do, and do it without actually touching that system. So this is now going to turn into active reconnaissance where we're actually f touching that system digitally. All right, so some of the things we're going to cover, ping, traceroute, telnet, and I believe netcat's in here too. Uh, yeah, there's netcat. So I know a lot of you guys may not still not understand the difference between passive and active. So here they kind of talk about it. So this would be passive, right? If you were looking and watching someone. So let's say uh, you know, you're spear fishing and you find a CEO and you're watching him, right? So that would be passive. You're watching him. You're not physically engaging. Active's right here where you actually go up to the building. You go here. He's trying to lock pick or whatever. That's active where you're actually physically touching that system. And that's what these actually do. Now, some of these might seem very simplistic, but they're also very useful. And a lot of tools that we use like Nmap and things like that use protocols like these. So it's good that you can go back and do it yourself if you needed to. All right, so that just tells us to launch it. All right, so first it's telling us the web browser is a very good tool, and that is correct. So what we're gonna do, 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 do. so it's telling you Fox, these are some of the add-ons you can use for pen testing. Foxy Proxy, I recommend that for anybody. We've used that in the past. User Agent Switcher, that's just gonna stop you from getting caught if you use a specific type of thing. Um, it allows you to change your OS, basically. Wappalizer, I use that quite a bit. It'll just give you kind of some of the technologies that are being used on the site so that you don't have to do any reconnaissance. It just tells you pretty easily. All right, so now it says browse the following website and tell them how many questions they have using developer tools. So all this is, is we're gonna go through here and we're looking for how many questions are back and forth, how many it's actually can ask. So you can see here, if we look through the HTML, we have our body, okay, we have our class. And there's nothing here, so it's probably all being ran in this script, right? So we'll go ahead to the script reveal in the source panel. And you can see, okay, here's where our actual questions are. So you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight questions in total that can happen. Okay, cool. So we put eight there, and boom, easy enough. That one was super easy. That's just kind of letting you guys know, see how you can use the um, web browser for reconnaissance. It's super simple. All right, now ping. Most of you are probably familiar with ping. You've heard of it. You know what it is, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the difference is the way you use ping is basically different. So a lot of network guys use ping for just checking um, is something on, is it network connectivity, that type of thing. Um, Hackers can use it similarly, but can also use it a little bit more advanced. Uh, so here you can see they're showing you just that ping tax C on a Linux box and then 10 
which 10 is just the count, is the same as tech in 10, which is number 10, whatever. So they're just showing you it's the same. And here's what it's gonna look like. When you ping something, you can see ping count five IP address. That's the syntax. You can see it's only gonna ping it five times. And then you can see they got replies from it five times. And it'll tell you here, five transmitted, five received. So that's really good because that means it's up and working and it's responding to us. So that that's huge. Um, so you can see, number one, the first thing we're gonna look for is, oh, it shows us right here, okay. Destination host is unreachable. So this is what it's gonna look like if the machine's off or if firewall's blocking it, okay. And firewalls do block these um, pretty often and that's okay. But it, it's still good to try it because even if it just barely lets us know any information, it's gonna let us know, okay, it works. Now, there's this doesn't cover it, it's a little more advanced, but there's ways that you can use ping to your advantage a lot more than this. You can use, um, obviously, time to live to actually trace the paths. Now, I know Tracer does this as well, or trace route, but the ping actually can do this. And then on top of that, you can use ping um, and set the size of packets to actually see what size your uh, firewall is gonna allow in and out so that you might have to parse your messages and things like that. So there's a lot that ping can do for you. Even if there's a tool that does it already for you, it's good to know that you can rely on ping if it's not working. All right, so it says, which option would you use to set the size of the data? Now this is pretty easy, but what it wants you to do is it wants you to actually use the man page and read it. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, so we're gonna scroll down. We're looking for what sets the size, okay? Do, 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 do. And if you look, scroll down, you'll see tech S is packet size. Okay, cool. So that's gonna be the size. Now, what is the size of the ICMP header and bytes? Now this one, I wouldn't expect you to know off the top of your head, but it does tell you right here, eight bytes of the header data. So it's telling us in advance, all right, now does Microsoft Firewall block the ping or block the ping by default? That is absolutely true. So if you were to ping, let's say your sister's computer or your brother's computer, or your mom's computer, or whatever, it's probably not going to go through. It's probably going to be blocked by Microsoft Firewall. That's typical uh, behavior, and that's what you'd expect. There's ways around this, but that's not in the scope of this book or of this uh, box. Excuse me. All right. So it says deploy the VM for this task using the tack box, issue the command, how many ping replies did you get? All right, we'll optimize it. So what it's wanting us to do is go ahead and ping 10 times and see if we get the 10 replies that we want. And the reason we're doing this is number one, to see if the machine is responding, if it's on, that type of thing. But we also want to see make sure that it doesn't start blocking them as well. Now, typically 10 isn't very many, so you're probably not gonna get blocked 10 after 10, but if you were to send it a million, right? So that is what was known as the ping of death, and that's also some of the first DOS attacks were just straight pings, right? If you send enough data, it will shut things down. You can't do that anymore because even if a firewall lets these through, it's probably gonna start blocking them after you know so many. So how many did we get in response? We got 10, perfect. So we know this machine is up and it's working and it's responding to us, perfect. All right, so now trace route. So trace route or tracer, however you wanna use it. Um, Windows uses tracer, so you're probably familiar with that. Um, basically what it's saying is how, how it's figuring these out, the trace or the route for you, is what it's doing is sending one time to live, so right here, it'll send a ping request basically with a time to live of one, okay? And when it does that, the first router is gonna send back a response saying, hey, time to live's dead, the packet's dead. Well, that's where you're getting, that's where you're getting the IP from that first router, this first stop, okay? And you can see here, they're showing you, it's counting down, if the time to live is 64, then the first one's 63, 62, 61, 60, etc. and it'll count down. Now, what they're doing here is they're showing that it's time to live, you set it to one, and that first router will send a response. Well, when it sends that response, you're getting the IP address with it, okay? So that's what's important. Now, 
Then you would send her a time to live of two, go to the next router. It'll send a, hey, packet's dead, response back to you. And that's how it's getting the IP address. So that's important to know, but it's also important to know how it works. So you can see here, you got your first, second. These are different hops, right? But these are the responses that you're getting from, you might get different responses from different routers. What that means is that at some point during the, um, because it's going to send three different three different requests out for one time to live, two time to live, et cetera, et cetera. When it does that, you may actually, what may actually happen is you may get different responses from different routers. That's not uncommon. It's not that big of a deal. What it is, is maybe one router got busy. Maybe one router is shorter now all of a sudden, or maybe one router was shorter and it was busy the first ping. Now it's not. So it, it's just finding you the best route. It's not necessarily saying that, oh crap, it's taking different routes, meaning someone's blocking you or anything like that. It's nothing crazy. All right, so this is the trace route A, and then this is trace route B, and you can see we have 14 here in A and 26 in B. Now, if you see these little asterisks, I think I just saw them. Um, I mean, there's an asterisk here, but basically, whoops. When you see an asterisk in traceroute, and you'll probably see it here if I traceroute, uh, what's the, uh, I don't know, the IP, hold on. We'll just do traceroute, tryhackme.com. And you'll see, probably see some asterisks. So yeah, you see an asterisk here, and so on and so forth. So that's not a big deal, but if you see the asterisk, what it is is usually that router isn't giving away its IP address, it, it's blocking it, that's fine, no big deal, skip it. Now if you need it, there's ways around it, but again, it's not uncommon to see it block or not respond. All right, so that's how you figure out the number of hops, and that's important because if you're, let's say you're attacking a machine, but you know their firewall, right? You can see how many hops, how many routers it's taking inside their network with Traceroute, and that can actually let you map out their network a little bit. All right, so in Traceroute A was the IP address of the last hop. And you can see this is the last hop. So there's the IP address. Boom. And Traceroute B what is the last hop. And you can see it's right there. Boom. All right, in traceroute B, how many routers are between the two systems? You can see there's 26 jumps, so it's touching 26 routers. Boom. Now this one says, start the attached VM from task three, trace route that box. So that's not a big deal. 10, 10, 41, 241. And check how many, okay. Well, of course there's not gonna be um, any hops because I'm in their VPN, right? So that's what it's saying. Perfect. Cool. Now, if I were to do it on my box, it'd probably work, but all right. So now that's trace route. It's pretty basic, pretty simple. I don't think you guys need a lot of time on trace route. Um, now tell that tell that's a little different. Tell that allows you to physically interact with it a little bit. Now, Telnet is, was developed in 1969, so it is an old protocol, and it's not going to really be in use anymore. But when I say that, you can still use it to gather information. So what they're showing here is using Telnet on port 80. So Telnet 10, 10, 41, 241, and then port 80. And then when it connects, it actually lets you type commands. Now, here's the important part, because I remember when I was in... I don't know, junior high or high school, right? And I was trying to learn how to hack. And one of the first things I was learning was Telnet because back then there wasn't all these protocols that are crazy and stuff. It just, Telnet was a big one. So with Telnet, I I would look everywhere. I would, Google wasn't as good, things like that, but I would search everywhere for Telnet commands, Telnet commands. I'm like, I can't figure out the commands when I'm telnetting into something, because something would let me connect, but then I can't figure out the commands. Well, here's the secret, guys. Whatever you're connecting to, so if you're using port 80, that means you're connecting with HTTP, so you have to speak its language, get command for HTTP right there. 
that's how you have to talk to it, okay? If you connect to a mail server, you have to use mail exchange commands, things like that. So keep in mind, it's whatever commands you're connecting to is what you need to do. That's very important to know. All right, so it says start the attach VM from task three on the attack box, open the terminal and use telnet. So let's go ahead and connect to it, telnet, and then uh, the IP's up here, do, do, do. okay, telnet 10, 10, 41, 241, and we'll do port 80, boom. All right, and you see it's letting me type, so get HTTP 1.1, hit enter, and then it's gonna ask us for some more information, and it's running right now, by the way. It doesn't look like it, but you notice it's still blinking, it's acting like it's not doing anything. It is running, it is gathering that information, so don't think that it's gonna be instantaneous, especially with these VMs. But you'll see it will be running. Okay, boom, and there you go. So you can see here, we did get some information. Cool, okay, so HTML 2.0, interesting. All right, the request timed out, that's fine. But here's the key, so even though the request timed out and technically we didn't get the information we wanted, right? We did get the Apache server and the actual version number. So now we have Apache, and then it's asking what's the version number running, 2.4.10, we have that. So we gathered all that information just simply by using Telnet. All right, so that's pretty simple, pretty easy, but you can see how Telnet allows you to connect and just get simple information because you're just sending little requests. You're not actually deep diving into it, but you are sending information, okay? All right, so now we're starting on Netcat. So we'll clear this out. All right, so Netcat. Netcat is the is a listener. So it's gonna listen and respond, if that makes sense. So Netcat or simply Netcat has different applications that can be great value. Yeah, yeah. Netcat supports both, yep. So it can do TCP and UDP, that is important to know. Um, it can function as a client that connects to a listening port. It can also act as a server that listens on a port of your choice. So what that means is if something else is listening, you can connect to it. Um, it also can listen for you for someone else to connect. So first you can connect to a server as you did with Telnet to collect its banner. So we're gonna do the same. I gotta wait for this thing to start, but it's gonna show me the IP in two seconds. Okay, so netcat 10.10. .10 219.59, okay, and then we're gonna say 80, and it's gonna do the same thing. Okay, so you see it, we're connected to it. Get the same, this is the exact same thing as, as uh, Telnet, but has more functionality. And then we'll say host, and we'll just say netcat, and we'll wait. And you can see it's pretty, um, it's pretty much the same. You can see that, but the problem is with these VMs when they freeze like that, I can't tell if it's still working or if it's actually frozen. There we go. Okay. So you can see here, this is a different page. So you can see that we actually got it looks like it's a very, it's a generic welcome page. So I bet if we went to this web server, it would just be the uh, initial web server was set up, but there was no pages added. Um, but you can see here, we got some good information. Number one, because it's a welcome page, we got the Ingix and Debian, or Debian, however you want to say it. We've got the information of what kind of server it is, so that's good. All right. And you can see here, they give us the version number already and everything. So we're already getting information that's very important. All right, and the terminal shown above, we use netcat, yep. And you can see we added that new line. You can name your host anything as it has no impact. Correct, so all it is is it's asking basically for the host name. And, do, 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 okay, so now it's just giving you the, this is information that it's good to know. Um, so this here, this netcat VNLP, You'll see it a million ways. You'll see LNVP, VNLP, however you want to say it, but you can see what it's going to do. So it's going to give you listen mode, okay? It's going to give you numerical only, no resolution of host name via DNS. So what that means is 
you need the IP address. You don't want DNS to be used there. Verbose output, which is um, important. And then the P is the port number. So one, two, three, four, whatever. So this command right here is what you're gonna see a lot with hackers. What it is is they're setting up a, a listener on their machine that's ready to go on whatever port they want and can do whatever they need it to do, right? And you could do it like this. Uh, I've never seen anyone do it like that, but you could. This will do the same thing. Um, so that's what you're gonna see a lot. So it says here, basically what, what you're doing is when you set that up is you're setting up a listener and then you're telling the machine, whatever machine you're hacking into, whatever, to reach back to your box so that now if you have a reverse shell or something, you have a way of communicating. That's what you're trying to do with Netcat, okay, on this side. So, um, do, do, do. now let's see, start the VM and open the attack box. Once the attack box loads, use Netcat to connect to the VM port 21. Okay, so we actually need to connect to port 21. So Netcat, and we'll just do the same thing. And we'll say 21. All right, and you can see here it's asking us what was the version of the running server. Okay, so it looks like version 6.4 is down there. That, that didn't take. So it's looking for this one here, point, 0 0.17, I think. And there you go. So that's your that answers that one. Now all it's doing here is connecting to that FTP server and using the, the netcat command to actually connect to it and then you could type FTP commands. Now, will you use this all the time to connect to other things? Probably not because there are simple things like Telnet. There's also um, you know FTP programs out there that you could just connect directly to it. You wouldn't need to use netcat and things, but it's a good starting point for one because it gives you basic information and it's not going to necessarily raise as many red flags if you tried to fully connect with an FTP device, you know, all that stuff. But basically, it's a very good starting point. The other big thing with Netcat that you need to take away that I wish they would have shown a little bit more is the reverse listener, to have a listener on your box that something can then connect to, okay? That's important. All right, so now we're going to put it all together. So we've, yeah, yeah we know we've covered a lot of tools in this box. Okay. Oh, it's just telling you, okay, so basically it's saying you can put it all together. So you can use tra Traceroute to map the path to the target. Now I know what a lot of people think when they think map the path is they're thinking basically, well, yeah, that's all the hops to, you know, from the internet over to that router. But what you're not seeing is if you connect to a specific target on their side and it gets through the firewall and it starts hopping in their network, you're seeing the routers in their network. So that's important because now you have IP addresses for their switches, their routers, things like that, that you're hopping through to get there. So now you have more of an attack vector starting to form, right? All right, then ping, that's pretty obvious. You're checking to see if it's up working. The other big thing is if it will respond to ICMP packets. That's important because that shows, okay, it's responding, that means it's accepting them and it's showing you how basically another attack vector how to get in telnet you're going to see which ports are open um you know we all know nmap does the same thing but telnet will basically nmap's going to scan so that's going to get caught pretty quick telnet you could theoretically check a port one at a time for you know common ports things like that um and it says here, it says it right there, available scanners do this at a much more advanced and sophisticated levels, as we'll see in the next four rooms with InMap, which is correct. The difference is, if you don't know InMap really well, you're probably gonna get blocked pretty quick, but that's just neither here nor there. There's scanners running the internet all the time. So, and you can see here, they're giving you some examples, but basically this is, oh, they actually show the Netcat listener right there. So they're showing it as a server and as a client. So you can connect using it this way and you can listen to other requests using it this way. And then the developer tools for um, for websites. This is actually a pretty good little cheat sheet you could print off and you could save. And we'll go ahead and complete the room. But that's a pretty good little room. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit simplistic. They could have shown a little bit more of the tools, but it's a really good introduction room. And I think it's something you guys should definitely practice. This is literally, and I'm not 
not saying this for any um, any other reason other than I truly believe it, but these are really the backbone that every hacker should know. Um, I really believe that because, like I said, when I was learning hacking when I was in junior high before security like this existed, right? These are the tools that you that hackers actually used. And I know nowadays you're not going to see it that often, but it is truly the backbone of what a lot of these tools are built on. These are the protocols that InMap, you know, all that stuff is built on. So I think it's really important and really cool to see history kind of from cyber security standpoint, from these tools being used before to now what's available and, and possible is just incredible. So I definitely think you guys should should really get good at these tools and understand them and, and just mess with them all the time because even if it's just a simple, you're a network engineer or something, you're just simply typing ping to see if something's up, it's very common to use these tools. So it's good to be familiar with them either way. Hopefully you guys liked that video. Um, I know I was a little bit gone for a while. I don't plan on it again. I will be busy this week with the first of the year coming, but I should still be able to get a video or two out. And then from there, we're going to go right back on track and I will get that log 4 j video out. It's just, it's a very complex thing that I'm trying to do correctly and not necessarily give someone the tools to go make the attack. Okay. So hopefully you guys like it and hopefully you guys understand. And I appreciate you guys. Thanks.